All right, so moving on to gout. I'm going to talk about gout. Gout is something that is extremely important to remember. This is tested on NCLEX all the time. So when we think about gout, okay, gout is a disease that results from the accumulation of uric acid in the blood. Okay, So again, when we think about gout or gouty arthritis, this is a disease that results from an accumulation of uric acid in the blood. And this causes crystals to form and accumulate around the joint. Uh, you have some pictures, uh, once we get through this slide, you have some different pictures uh, associated with gout that you can look at uh, with TOFI and different things like that. So again, when we think about gout, this results from an accumulation of uric acid in the blood, and that is going to cause these urate crystals okay, to form and accumulate around the joints. It's actually caused by an ineffective metabolism of purines. So when we think about gout, we should be thinking about purines. So it's an ineffective metabolism of purines. Now, purines are found, okay, in some foods, and they're broken, they're broken down into uric acid by the liver. So let's say that one more time so we all understand it. Purines are found in foods, in some foods, and they are broken down into uric acid by the liver. A diet that is rich in purines or high in purines can increase uric acid levels in the body, and that's going to lead to gout. Now, uric acid is excreted in the urine, okay, so it is typically excreted in the urine, but in some people, okay, in some people, uh, those levels go extremely high, okay, and they're not, this, it's not metabolized correctly, and the uric acid starts to climb in their bloodstream, and you probably need to add this to your notes, because I don't believe they explained it well in the book. So again, purines are found in some foods, and they're broken down into uric acid by the liver, and a diet that is rich in purines can increase uric acid levels in the body, and that leads to gout. Usually, uric acid is excreted in the urine. Now, when we think about these purines and we think about uric acid, okay, uh, TOFI, when we think about TOFI, T-O-P-H-I, TOFI, TOFI is a nodular mass. It's like a mass of uric acid crystals, okay? This TOFI can appear in cartilage. It can appear in our tendons, soft tissue, the joints, the skin, all kinds of places, okay? So again, all TOFI is is a mass of uric acid crystals. It's just a mass of uric acid crystals. So when you hear the word TOFI, your mind should automatically go to gout, Okay, and what's going on? How did my person develop gout? Well, because purines that are found in some foods, okay, that are typically broken down into uric acid by the liver, okay, for some, for some reason, whatever's going on with my patient, that uric acid is not excreted properly from the body or they're just having way too much purine, uh, high content foods in their diet, okay? And that's leading to gout. So a tof when we think about TOFI, this is just a mass of those uric acid crystals that are accumulating. Now, very importantly, and this would be some very important patient teaching, what foods are high in purines that we would want to teach our patient to stay away from? Okay, this is important NCLEX stuff right here. So when we think about foods that are high in purine, and this is extremely important, foods that are high in purine, Organ meats, okay? Organ meats like liver, kidney, tongue, okay? Mushrooms, bacon, scallops, anchovies, beer, okay? So that's what we're talking about right here. These are foods that are high in purines. Again, organ meats, liver, kidney, tongue. Then other things like mushrooms, bacon, scallops, anchovies, and beer. Now, your body 
Again, make sure you understand the process. Your body produces uric acid when it breaks down purines. Okay, so your body produces uric acid when it breaks down purines. Um, again, and what does that? The liver. So understand the physiological process of gout and you understand a whole lot of things uh, that you'll be able to answer correctly on the test. You've got to understand the physiology of things. <clears throat> so again, your body produces uric acid when it breaks down purines. And the liver is what has that role, that function, is the liver that does that. Now when we think about gout, gout affects men more frequently than women. Uh, typically the big toes, when we think about where uh, most of the time where gout occurs, it typically occurs in the big toes. They are involved in 75% of the cases. So typically the big toes are involved in 75% of the cases. Other joints, uh, your feet, your fingers, your wrists, they can be involved as well. Clinical manifestations of gout, excruciating pain. If they say it's a pain you cannot even imagine. So excruciating pain, edema, inflammation, and that inflammation most commonly is in the big toe or the great toe, whichever way you want to say it, the great toe or the big toe, that is where we see the inflammation. That's the most common site. Tophi, okay, around the rims of the ear, okay, that can cause disfigurement. Uh, you can uh, surgically uh, remove it. Uh, some people, uh, of course, opt for that tophi to be removed from their ear because you especially if you're a male or if you are a female and you wear your hair short, you can actually see it. And I put a picture of it in a slide for you to look at. Um, again, the TOFI, these are just lumps of crystallized uric acid, okay, that's accumulated. Again, we said it can accumulate in cartilage, tendons, joints, wherever. Now, during my assessment subjectively, my patient's going to complain of pain at night in the great toe or in other joints. Make sure as a nurse you do a dietary history and ask about alcohol consumption. Again, we said uh, something that's high in purines is beer. Okay, so that's something you need to ask about is alcohol consumption. Uh, ask about uh, what their diet is in regards to are they taking in a lot of food that is high in purines, like those organ meats. Uh, your book elaborates here a little bit more, talks about organ meats being brain, kidney, liver, heart, anchovies, yeast, hearing, mackerel, scallops, things like that. So make sure you know all those food items that we just talked about that are high in purines. Objective data, I'm going to do an assessment of the joints, especially the great toe. I'm looking for edema, heat, discoloration, limited movement. Vital signs might reveal an increased temperature, hypertension, tachycardia, uh, increase in respirations. Assess urinary output. And the, why are we checking, why do we care about gout and urinary output? Well, here is why. Make sure you assess a, person who ha a patient who has gout. Make sure you are paying very close attention to their urinary output because TOFI can actually form in the kidneys and alter renal function. So TOFI can form in the kidneys. So assess the patient also for TOFI in their earlobes, their fingers, their hands, toes, all, all those different areas. Diagnostic tests, they're going to do serum, uh, uh, urinary uric acid levels. They're going to do CBCs. Uh, they're going to see in the CBC results, um, may show leukocytosis. When a patient has leukocytosis, that means their uh, white blood cells are elevated. May also show anemia. Okay, again, what we already talked about, the anemia of inflammation. <clears throat> uh, they'll have an elevated ESR. We've already talked about that. If your patient has an elevated ESR, that is indicative of inflammation. They may also uh, check the synovial fluid, okay, and see that it contains a uh, those urate crystals. Now, how are we going to medically manage gout? Well, uh, different types of drugs. Uh, colchicine is one. It is an anti-inflammatory. These are on NCLEX all the time. Okay, so colchicine is an anti-inflammatory. They might use that. 
Um, endomethacin is an anti-inflammatory. Corticosteroids, okay, anti-inflammatory. Allupurinol. Allupurinol uh, decreases uric acid production, so that would be helpful. Probenicid increases uric acid secretion by the kidneys, so that would decrease the levels. Okay, so you have uh, lots of different types of medications uh, that can be uh, given to help a patient manage their gout. Nursing interventions and patient teaching. Give medications as ordered. You always do that for pain and inflammation. When administering colchicine, be alert to side effects like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. A very, very important thing to remember right here with gout, increase fluid intake to at least 2,000 milliliters, okay, to aid in the elimination of all those urates in the body, all that uric acid, okay? Um, again, 10 to 20% of patients have uric acid uh, kidney stones. And again, you can have tophi of the kidneys that occurs. So increasing fluid intake is very important. Document your INO. Advise the patient to avoid alcohol and purine foods. Maintain bed rest, immobilization of the joints. Okay, use a bed cradle, and I put a picture, uh, a slide on here of a bed cradle. Use a bed cradle to prevent pressure, okay, of the linens. Of they, a person with gout, I've had several patients with gout say to me, just the very uh, slight pressure of the covers touching their toes is excruciatingly painful. So by using bed cradles, that prevents that pressure of the covers on those joints. Patient teaching, give information related to the disease and the importance of keeping those serum uric acid levels within normal limits by taking their medications as they're prescribed, following their diet, avoiding infections, uh, lack of sleep and stress. Some patients may have to take uh, colchicine, probenicid, and allopurinol as a maintenance dose, okay? Even when they have no signs and symptoms present because they're just that apt to, you know, have a reoccurrence of gout. So they will just go ahead and take those medications as maintenance doses. All right, make sure you take a look at your patient problems at the end of the gout information. You have two patient problems and nursing interventions you need to make sure you read. All right, moving on to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, um, of course, is uh, the reduction of bone density. It is most common in women 55 to 65. Uh, it's believed to be caused by a loss of estrogen. You have some very important contributing factors, okay, and some of these you need to add to your notes. And like I said, they're extremely important, so you better make sure you know these. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some contributing factors to osteoporosis include uh, anyone who has uh, taken steroids, okay, so steroids can lead to osteoporosis, and that is a contributing factor. High intake of caffeine, okay, so anyone who has had high intake of caffeine, caffeine actually removes calcium from bone. So if you're someone who has a lot of caffeine intake, you better keep that into consideration. A diet that is low in calcium, okay, a diet that is high in protein, Okay, protein and sodium actually causes increased calcium excretion in the urine. So high amounts of protein and sodium causes increased calcium excretion in the urine. That is uh, the reason why it is a contributing factor to osteoporosis. Also someone who has a sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle, I believe that's one you need to add to your notes. <clears throat> a sedentary lifestyle, so somebody who is a couch potato. A small bone structure, someone who has small bone structure is also uh, at increased risk and that is a contributing factor. So those are the main ones that you need to think about with contributing factors. And we're gonna talk about a few other things here in just a second. So to recap, contributing factors to osteoporosis, steroids, high caffeine intake, a diet low in calcium, diet high in protein and sodium, and someone who has a sedentary lifestyle and small bone structure. Okay, so when we think about osteoporosis, it affects the vertebrae, can affect the, uh, the neck area of the femur, the pelvis, the hands, the wrists. 
People who are most at risk, and this is extremely important, people who are most at risk are small framed, okay, small framed, white, and that means of European descent, or Asian race, non-obese, okay, non-obese is small framed, okay, so non-obese or small framed, post-menopausal, okay, post-menopausal women, and also if you are a smoker or if you're someone who has had um, or who has alcoholism, okay, and the reason why post-menopausal is in there is because with postmenopausal women, we have low um, estrogen. We have low amounts of estrogen. So low estrogen increases osteoclast activity. Okay. If you go back to A and P, you remember you had the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. The osteoblasts, remember, those are the cells responsible for bone formation. The osteoclasts were the cells that broke down bone tissue. Okay, so they broke down bone tissue. So with postmenopausal women, you have low estrogen, okay, and that increases the osteoclasts activity. So they're breaking down more and more bone tissue, okay, and that releases calcium out into the bloodstream. So that's the perfect storm for the development of osteoporosis. So let's again uh, recap that part. Most risk, when we think about the most risk group, small framed, Okay, which means non-obese, non-obese, white of European descent or Asian race, postmenopausal women, uh, smoking and alcoholism. Okay, so those are all going to make you at higher risk if you're a smoker or if you're someone who partakes in a lot of alcohol. <clears throat> Excuse me. So clinical manifestations of osteoporosis. Add this one to your notes. Backache. Okay, um, a lot of patients have, um, they, they complain of pain in their back. Uh, fractures may be the first symptom noted before a, a diagnosis of osteoporosis. And usually they suffer from some sort of vertebral fracture and then they get the diagnosis of osteoporosis. You see uh, also with clinical manifestations, besides fractures, uh, a loss of height. Okay, so they're not as tall as they used to be. Um, they can also be uh, have a stooped appearance. Okay, kind of like that humpbacked appearance. During my assessment, subjectively, I'm going to ask them about their lifestyle practices. Uh, they can tell me about their complaints of pain. Uh, it typically worsens when they are sitting, uh, standing, uh, coughing, sneezing, and straining can also bring on pain. They might tell you that. Objectively, I'm going to uh, assess for what is called a dowager's hump. Okay, and I put a picture of this on the slides that you'll get to in a little bit. So you're assessing for what is called a dowager's hump. And that is a rounded uh, hump in the upper back, okay, due to bone loss. Uh, it's a spinal deformity. Uh, you see height loss that occurs. And a lot of the times that is due to the repeated uh, spinal and vertebral fractures that occur. So you're assessing for a dowager's hump, that rounded hump in the upper back. Sometimes you will see dowager's hump and kyphosis used interchangeably, okay, that rounding of the thoracic spine. So sometimes you will see uh, kyphosis and dowager's hump again used interchangeably. So for osteoporosis, I'm assessing for a dowager's hump. I'm looking for increased lordosis. Uh, lordosis just means increased curvature of the lumbar region, and, and these terms are located at the end of this chapter, and we'll go over them again. So lordosis is just an increased curvature of the lumbar region. Um, anything else here? Okay, scoliosis. Scoliosis, again, the lateral curvature of the spine. And it, uh, toward the end of this chapter, you have pictures of those that we'll get to again, like I said later. You're going to assess for gait impairments, okay, and things like that. Diagnostic tests, they, they can uh, check uh, CBCs, check their calcium, phosphorus levels, alkaline phosphatase to diagnose bone disease. So they can do a whole array of different tests. They're going to do radiographic studies where they're going to 
uh, check, do x-rays. They can do bone mineral density tests to see how tightly the bone is packed. <clears throat> usually the hip and the spine is usually measured. Um, some of the pharmacological management. When we think about uh, calcium supplements with total calcium uh, intake of 1,200 milligrams daily in males and postmenopausal women, and then 2,000 milligrams daily being the maximum amount. Uh, also, vitamin D, they might add that in as well, 800 international units daily of vitamin D. Uh, limit alcohol use, again, that's important because uh, alcohol can interfere with the absorption of calcium and vitamin D. Weight-bearing exercises, certain medications, alendronate, sometimes uh, you may hear this also called it Fosamax. Uh, some of these drugs that we're going to talk about, abandronate and all these, the Boniva, these are bone resorption inhibitors, okay? And they increase bone density. They're given PO. The one thing about these medications that you have to remember, and it's very important, and I'm sure that they, uh, you will go over this in pharmacology. <clears throat> when you think about alendronate, abandronate, and all of these increasing bone density, um, make sure you administer these drugs first thing in the morning. And make sure you administer them with six to eight ounces of water at least 30 minutes before other medications beverages or food because it will decrease the amount um, of these medications being absorbed by the body. So we don't want to interfere with the amount of these medications being absorbed in the body. So make sure that you uh, give these medications with six to eight ounces of water and at least 30 minutes before other medications, beverages or food. So we don't interfere with the absorption of the medication. Another important thing to remember with these is the patient must remain upright for 30 minutes after the, uh, the dosage, and that's to facilitate the passage of the medication into the stomach and it, to prevent esophageal irritation. Because if these medications get lodged uh, in the esophagus for any amount of time, it can lead to esophageal irritation. Now, you have um, a chart in your book of medications that are associated with osteoporosis. Um, make sure with your osteoporosis you read your cultural considerations in the blue box. Make sure you read um, these medications for osteoporosis that we're getting ready uh, to take a look at. When you look at these medications, you have a, a conglomeration of meds that are known as um, but bisphosphonates, and there you see the alendronate, uh, the resendronate, all of these medication, abandronate, all of these. Okay, now we're going to go over some very important nursing implications with these bisphosphonates. Okay, so look over there at your nursing implications for this class of drugs. Administer, like we said, first thing in the morning, six to eight ounces of plain water. 30 minutes before other medications, beverages, or food. Also, make sure they sit upright for 30 minutes to avoid esophageal irritation. All right, when we uh, think about this group of uh, medications, we have to be uh, mindful of the fact that this group of medications uh, has um, been associated with an increased risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw, okay, of the jawbone. Uh, so osteonecrosis, uh, what that means is you have a lack of blood supply to a bone. So if you have a lack of blood supply to a bone, it is going to necrose, okay? We know that a uh, bone has a blood supply and it needs uh, nutrients and uh, things, oxygenation and things like that. When you have a lack of blood supply to the bone, it's going to necrose and die. So these groups of medications, the bisphosphonates that we're talking about right here, you have an increased risk for osteonecrosis, okay, of the jaw, the, the jaw, I'm saying J-A-W, the jawbone, okay? So osteonecrosis of the jawbone with the bisphosphonates. Then you see some other medications down through there. Be sure and uh, read through those, but that uh, is some very important information to you for you to remember with the bisphosphonates. 
Um, all right, so we went through all of those. Make sure you read, again, your uh, cultural considerations and make sure you read your patient teaching. It's very important. Let's go ahead and go over that patient teaching because there's something you need to add to this list. So when we look at patient teaching for dietary needs in osteoporosis, uh, we see calcium is a mineral that can slow bone loss and may decrease fractures. A total of 1,200 to 2,000 milligrams of calcium is needed daily in the diet um, or through supplements. Food sources of calcium include milk products, uh, green vegetables, many of the green vegetables, calcium fortified orange juice, uh, soy milk. Now, vitamin D, why is it necessary to take vitamin D with calcium? Well, because vitamin D helps calcium absorption, okay, and stimulates bone formation. So in order to absorb calcium, we have to have an ample amount of vitamin D or you're not going to be able to absorb calcium appropriately. So vitamin D helps with calcium absorption and then therefore stimulates bone formation. Uh, a diet low in sodium, animal proteins, and caffeine is recommended, and we already talked about that. Foods that are high in calcium, this is some important patient teaching right here, very important. So foods that are high in calcium include whole and skim milk, yogurt, <clears throat> turnip greens, cottage cheese, ice cream, sardines with the bones, spinach, and add broccoli to that. So add broccoli to that list. So after spinach, add broccoli. Very important. Know those, know those uh, specific foods that uh, are rich in calcium, high in calcium. This is important patient teaching right here. Okay, so make sure you know that. And again, add broccoli to that item list. <clears throat> All right, so surgical interventions. Surgical interventions for uh, someone who has osteoporosis. There is two types of uh, surgical uh, interventions that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to place uh, a video um, on my YouTube channel for you to access and watch the procedure for a vertebroplasty and a kyphoplasty. Sometimes when you read about something and then you watch a video of it, it helps you to remember. All right, so let's take a look at this. When we think about a vertebroplasty and a kyphoplasty, they help to relieve pain due to compression fractures. Okay, so again, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty help to re, uh, relieve pain due to compression fractures of the spine. It has a success rate of 90%. Now, when we think about vertebroplasty, this is using a high-pressure injection okay, of a cement. So you have high-pressure injection of a cement into the spine that pushes the vertebrae apart, <clears throat> and uh, the patient can be under general or local anesthesia. Um, a kyphoplasty, okay, the kyphoplasty is really good about uh, correcting uh, the dowager's hump in osteoporotic patients. Okay, again, a kyphoplasty is correcting a dowager's hump associated with osteoporosis. This is where you have, uh, with a kyphoplasty, you have the insertion of a balloon into the center of a collapsed vertebrae. And that is done to restore the position of the vertebrae. It kind of creates a space is what it's doing. It's actually creating a space for the injection of the cement. And when you watch those, uh, that video on the two, uh, it'll make uh, perfect sense with the vertebroplasty and the kyphoplasty. Now, what are some nursing considerations involved with either one of these procedures? Well, the patients are required to stay up to 24 hours after um, either one, the vertebroplasty or the kyphoplasty. <clears throat> um, flat bed rest for the first uh, four hours and then they can ambulate uh, as able. Uh, small dressing will be on the operative site and then of course uh, usually uh, just follow your orders. Antibiotics and steroids are usually ordered <clears throat> times three doses. So nursing interventions and patient teaching with osteoporosis. Uh, diet rich in milk and dairy. Two of the things that we think about that would be um, good things uh, that would be rich uh, when we think about a diet rich in milk and dairy, think about things like broccoli and yogurt. Those would be two things that would be high in calcium and good for the patient. Again, 
broccoli and yogurt. Okay, and that's important to remember. Avoiding caffeine, again, because caffeine removes calcium from the bone. So avoiding that, um, avoiding ca uh, caffeine and phosphorus, um, they contribute, uh, again, to uh, the bone loss. Teaching relaxation techniques, uh, smoking cessation, uh, safety measures, having the side rails up, <clears throat> excuse me, um, handrails, utilizing handrails, bedside commodes with a seat, the elevators for the seat, so um, you know the patient does not have to sit down so far on a, a commode that's uh, closer to the ground, so those elevators on the uh, seats of the commodes are helpful. Rubber shower mats to reduce the risk of falls. Keep the patient as ambulatory as possible. Uh, to prevent further bone loss. Again, we need to encourage ambulation. <clears throat> encourage weight-bearing exercises to increase bone density. Uh, decrease excessive proteins in the diet. Again, because we said proteins uh, causes more calcium to be excreted in the urine. Uh, recommended daily allowance of uh, daily calcium in postmenopausal women. <clears throat> Taking estrogen is 1,000 milligrams uh, and then a, uh, 1,500 milligrams for those not taking estrogen postmenopausal. Vitamin D regimen, um, adequate calcium and vitamin D uh, education. You know, you're teaching them why it's important. Uh, moderate activities such as walking, uh, bike riding, swimming, things like that are important. Uh, make sure you read your patient problem after osteoporosis you have one it's called insufficient knowledge related to issues of home care so make sure you read that again always read your patient problem and your nursing interventions those green boxes at the end of each <clears throat> of each segment of whatever disease process we're talking about all right moving on to osteomyelitis osteomyelitis is just simply an infection uh, in the bone it can also be in the bone marrow so it's an infection of the bone, the bone marrow. Um, staphylococci, uh, that is the most common cause of osteomyelitis. Again, staphylococci, very important. That is your most common cause of osteomyelitis. Uh, when we think about uh, staph, it can be introduced through some sort of trauma, whether it was an injury uh, or some a surgery, okay, or via the bloodstream from another site in the body, and then it goes to the bone. Bacteria invade the bone, and it causes the degeneration of the bone. Uh, the patient can have spontaneous fractures, or what we call pathological fractures that we already talked about. That's where you sustain a fracture due to a disease process that weakened the bone. <clears throat> um, when we think about osteomyelitis, uh, it can be a continuous persistent problem or it can be a problem of um, remissions and exacerbations. Pus, when we think about osteomyelitis, pus can actually come up to the surface of the skin with osteomyelitis. Amputation may be required. Now, the outlook is more favorable if osteomyelitis is treated early. According to my own research, uh, debridement and antibiotics <clears throat> have been uh, more successful uh, with patients uh, when it has been started uh, three to five days, okay, of the start of the uh, osteomyelitis infection. Okay, so if they have debridement and antibiotics, uh, they tend to be more successful if those are started within three to five days <clears throat> of the beginning of this uh, infection with osteomyelitis. Clinical manifestations of osteomyelitis. This uh, patient is going to be prone to contractures. Okay, contractures we know, I'm sure a lot of us who have worked in healthcare, a lot of you all have seen contractures, that permanent shortening of a muscle, uh, tendons and ligaments, it causes a deformity. Uh, sometimes they can be reversed, a lot of the times they can't. So contractures are a big problem with osteomyelitis. Uh, and especially if uh, the patient's extremity is not positioned correctly. Infections can develop months or years after the diagnosis of the initial infection. So they can have osteomyelitis and in two or three years later, they have the osteomyelitis is back, okay? During my assessment subjectively, um, I'm gonna get a complete history of the injury, of any injuries, surgical procedures, 
I'm going to assess for um, any complaints that my patient has of persistent, severe, or increasing bone pain, tenderness, muscle spasms. I'm going to assess for allergies because this patient is going to be on long-term antibiotic therapy. So I'm assessing for allergies. Objectively, the, with the objective data, I'm going to inspect wounds and drainage for the color, the amount. I'm checking for odor. If, you know, if a drainage is malodorous, you know, malodorous means that it, it does not have a very pleasant smell. So that is indicative of infection. So I'm monitoring my vital signs also for signs of infection, okay? If my patient spikes a temp, if they're getting tachycardic, their respirations are increasing, okay? <clears throat> Diagnostic tests, I'm going to do, uh, uh, we're going to have a complete history done, physical exam, x-rays, MRIs, CTs. We're going to check for inflammation. We've already been over this, and we know what two labs we're going to look at for inflammation, ESR and CRP. Medical management, prolonged IV antibiotic therapy, okay? So um, that'll be up to the physician, <clears throat> whichever antibiotic is prescribed. Some of the ones your book talks about, penicillin, uh, neomycin, genomycin, things like that. It's all going to depend on the pathogen, okay? So whenever we do a culture, okay, when we do a culture and sensitivity, like of a drainage, for example, <clears throat> we're trying to figure out... Um, well, why we are doing that is we're trying to figure out what organism, okay, what pathogen we're dealing with so my patient can be placed on the correct antibiotic. Because if my patient is placed on an antibiotic that that certain pathogen or organism is resistant to, that patient is taking an antibiotic for no reason whatsoever. It's not helping them at all. So we've got to have our CNS results back so we know what uh, antibiotic that organism is going to be susceptible to, okay, or be sensitive to. Um, the antibiotic therapy can uh, go on for as long as six months. Bed rest is uh, prescribed. Surgery might be necessary. Wound management and debridement, and also the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and I've placed a video for you to watch about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What hyperbaric oxygen therapy does is it stimulates tissue growth and repair. Okay, it uses high levels of oxygen. It uses 100% oxygen to stimulate uh, new tissue growth and repair. And so make sure you watch that video uh, related to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, nursing interventions and patient teaching. Uh, be very gentle when moving an extremity because this patient is going to be in some severe pain. Uh, they may have to uh, be on absolute uh, bed rest to rest that affected part, uh, position the patient using pillows, sandbags, uh, things like that to ensure good alignment of the extremity because, again, we want to prevent contractures. Wounds um, are irrigated with things like saline or other solutions, then cover with a sterile dressing. And make sure you always use strict surgical asepsis. Patients who are placed on drainage and secretion precautions, uh, make sure you take note of that. Uh, dietary planning uh, with a diet that's high in calories, proteins, and vitamins. Uh, monitor your vital signs. Monitor your lab results. Uh, teach your patient uh, the signs and symptoms of infection and what to look for. Uh, since chronic osteomyelitis can last uh, a person's lifetime, teach the patient uh, what to watch for as far as signs and symptoms of a recurrence of osteomyelitis. <clears throat> Patients must avoid trauma. Now, this is extremely important, okay? This is extremely important right here. Patients must avoid trauma to that affected bone. So if they had osteomyelitis, let's say, in their right femur, they have got to avoid trauma to that right femur related to pathological fractures. So avoiding trauma to the affected bone is extremely important due to pathological fractures. And again, we said a pathological fracture is just a bone fracture that's caused by a disease. Okay, and that led to the weakening of the bone structure. <clears throat> now... Right there is where your quiz will end.
Okay, so nothing from this point on will be on your quiz. The quiz stops right there. Okay, now moving on to fibromyalgia syndrome, sometimes called FMS. Okay, when we think about uh, fibromyalgia syndrome, uh, it's a chronic syndrome of pain in the muscles, the bones, the joints. It tends to be more common in women <clears throat> and in uh, people ages 20 to 50. Uh, it contributes to things like headaches, poor sleep, altered thought processes, stiffness, muscle aching, different things like that. So they don't know what is the cause of fibromyalgia. There are theories, but theories doesn't mean fact. So there's different theories as why do people develop FMS. We don't know. So what are the clinical manifestations? Well, there's generalized aching. A lot of times in the neck, the lower back, they have morning stiffness. Some aggravating factors for fibromyalgia, cold, humid, uh, cold or humid weather, physical or mental fatigue, excess physical activity, anxiety and stress. Um, other clinical manifestations we see, difficulty sleeping, headaches, uh, tingling and numbness in the hands, the feet. Uh, they have cognitive uh, problems, anxiety, depression. Uh, make sure you add this to your notes. Very important with the clinical manifestations. This used to be in the book and they took it out. <clears throat> and it is still something that I've heard many of my patients complain of. So another important clinical manifestation associated with fibromyalgia is the sensation of edematous hands. Okay, they feel like their hands are swollen. Okay, that's what we're talking about, edematous. So they have the sensation of edematous hands, but there are no visible signs of edema. You do not see any edema in their hands, but yet that person who has FMS uh, says that they have the sensation that their hands are swollen. Okay, so add that to your notes, the sensation of edematous hands, very important. During my assessment subjectively, question your patient about muscle pain. Uh, they might tell you they're having headaches, jaw pain, excess fatigue, anxiety, depression, <clears throat> numbness and tingling, memory problems. Objective data, you might see limb movement. So they're, especially at night, uh, moving their lower extremities, okay, a whole lot, kind of like restless leg syndrome. Ask the patient about sleep deprivation. Uh, the ability to complete uh, self-care. Diagnostic tests. When you think about fibromyalgia, diagnostic tests, first, the, the only way you get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia is by a process of eliminating other conditions. So you're not just going to go and all of a sudden they will say, well, you know what, you have fibromyalgia. They're going to have to do a whole array of tests, lots of tests, to eliminate the possibility of other disease processes causing these symptoms. So you get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia uh, by a process of elimination of other conditions. There is no specific laboratory or radiographic test to diagnose it. So they might do CBCs, ESRs, RFs, which is your rheumatoid factors, uh, sleep studies, they'll do all kinds of tests, okay? And when they have ruled out everything else, then you get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Now, with medical management, there is no cure. Uh, patient education and reassurance is important. Uh, reassuring them that uh, fibromyalgia is not a psychiatric disturbance, okay? And symptoms are not uncommon, okay? Because a lot of times they might think, I've had all of these tests and everything has been ruled out and they're telling me there's nothing wrong with me, but I know that there is. So then people start thinking that they're, they're crazy, okay? It's all in their head when it's not. It's not a psychiatric disturbance. These symptoms are real to the people who suffer from fibromyalgia. Now, some of the medications you may see used uh, to help with fibromyalgia include uh, tricyclic antidepressants, which we'll talk about in mental health more. Uh, these are used um, and they provide antidepressant results uh, and they also have anti-inflammatory properties. They help with muscle relaxation and uh, pain inhibition. 
So you have in your book a chart that says medications for fibromyalgia syndrome. It's in an orange box. And you see all these different drugs listed down through here. And we're just going to talk about these very briefly because you'll talk about these more in pharmacology. So amitriptyline, that's your tricyclic antidepressant. You see its action. It helps with pain and stiffness, improves sleep. Okay. You see your cyclobenzaprine. Uh, okay. That's a muscle relaxer. That's going to help with pain and things like that. You see your clonazepam, that is a benzodiazepine, an anti-anxiety medication, okay? That can help with the constant leg movement when we were talking about like restless leg syndrome that occurs at night. Uh, the next one, uh, tramadol, uh, acetaminophen and tramadol. Uh, these are used together or given alone for the management of moderate to severe pain. <clears throat> you see your Lyrica there, which is an anticonvulsant that helps with pain. Uh, the next one, the Xanaflex, that is a muscle relaxer that helps with pain. Uh, the sodium uh, oxidate, that is a CNS depressant that, in, that helps uh, to improve deep sleep and it reduces pain and fatigue. And then you see your uh, duloxetine there, which is an antidepressant. Okay, that helps with pain as well. So you can see antidepressants are not only effective with depression, but a lot of them have a lot of other uh, properties that can help patients with things like pain, uh, stiffness, improvement of sleep, and things like that. Uh, again, you do not have to memorize any of these medications, just a familiarity with them. Okay, Okay. so moving on to my nursing interventions and my patient teaching. Um, that is going to involve education uh, on uh, exercises, relaxation techniques, uh, teach about good sleep hygiene, uh, and you've got a box, a blue box right under the orange one that says patient teaching sleep hygiene, and uh, it has one, two, three, four, five bullets there. Make sure you read those, okay, about sleep hygiene. Uh, Non-impact exercising like uh, swimming, stationary cycling, walking, yoga, things like that can be very effective and help a patient who has fibromyalgia. So here is an example when we were talking about gout and the deposit of the urate crystals. Here is an example of TOFI um, in the cartilage of the ear. You can see the deposits there in white. Here you can see uh, TOFI. You can see the swollen and inflamed joint there. You can see that mass of uric acid crystals, which uh, we refer to as TOFI. Uh, you can see those uh, crystals represented there. And again, remember we said uh, the majority of the time, whenever a person suffers from gout, they, uh, the first complaint is they have uh, pain in that great toe or big toe. And you can see right there is a representation of that. Here you see uh, an example of a bed cradle when we were talking about the excruciating pain that patients go through when suffering from gout. And this bed cradle keeps those linens off of the, uh, the toes because patients, I have many, I've had many patients throughout the years who have suffered from gout and they say even just that light weight of the blankets and sheets uh, touching their toes, it causes excruciating pain for them. So we can uh, help our patients by using uh, the intervention of a bed cradle to alleviate that problem. Here we have an example of a dowager's hump. We know the dowager's hump, again, uh, is associated with osteoporosis. Uh, you can see the rounding of the thoracic spine there. Uh, with the dowager's hump, remember sometimes a dowager's hump and kyphosis, those two terms are used interchangeably. So this is an example of a dowager's hump, and this is evident uh, in our patients who have osteoporosis. <clears throat> 